Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining me for uh, the Awakenings and Epiphanies event. Um, it's a series of uh, short uh, narratives about the process of awakening and experiences that the speakers have had. And the speakers are from all walks of life, very diverse. And uh, our first speaker is Dr. Jerry Brown, uh, who hails from Portugal. And um, uh, he's a founding professor of anthropology at Florida International University, co-author of the book, The Psychedelic Gospels, which he wrote with uh, his wife. Uh, Julie Brown, and he teaches a course on psychedel psychedelics and culture uh, on uh, psychedelics today. So he's going to, his topic is cosmic consciousness and mystical experiences, and I'm really happy to welcome Dr. Jerry Brown. I just want to reiterate, it takes a lot of effort and commitment to put something like this together, so thank you. And I really appreciate the opportunity to give the opening talk here, and it's a topic I feel completely at home with speaking about awakenings and epiphanies catalyzed through theogens and life events. Because, um, well, during the past half century, since my first LSD experience with orange sunshine, psychedelics have literally created my life, transformed my life, and immeasurably enriched my life. Uh, psychedelic epiphanies have profoundly guided my teaching my research, my activism in social change organizations, they were even the catalyst for my relationship and marriage with my beloved wife, uh, Julie Brown of 40 years and the co-author of our book. Let's talk about mystical experience. Albert Hoffman, who discovered LSD, had wrote a book called LSD, My Problem Child. Stanislav Grof, one of the founders of LSD psychotherapy, said, LSD is a child prodigy born in to a dysfunctional family. And I would add that the psychedelic renaissance has provided excellent family therapy for psychedelics, bringing them into the cultural mainstream by clinically demonstrating their benefits for treating mental health issues, and now more and more even physiological medical issues. Amazingly, it turns out that mystical experience is the key to healing in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And this is documented in the Johns Hopkins and the NYU psilocybin cancer research out of which they concluded, and here's the quote that really grabbed Julie and my attention. In both trials, the intensity of the mystical experience described by patients correlated with the degree to which their depression and anxiety decreased. So in other words, people suffering from anxiety, depression, fear of death, these are advanced cancer patients. In one or two psilocybin sessions, the more intense the mystical experience they had, the greater alleviation from their distress that was achieved. I wanna briefly mention three seminal studies of psilocybin and mystical experience, which scientifically proved that the personal anecdotal uh, stories from the 1960s and 70s of transcendent religious experiences on psychedelics were accurate. The first was done by Walter Pankey in 1962 as part of the Leary uh, Harvard Psilocybin Project. It's called the Miracle of Marsh Chapel because on Good Friday in Marsh Chapel located on Boston campus of Boston University, Pankey and his associates divided 20 Protestant divinity students into two groups. Um, 10 of them received a high dose of suicide. 10 of them received, uh, 10 of them received niacin, B12. 
which gave people a rush. So this was the control group. What they found out was that nine of the 10 Protestant divinity students had a full-blown religious or spiritual experience, including Houston Smith, who went on to become one of the world's most famous teachers of religion, who called it, quote, the most powerful cosmic homecoming I have ever experienced. He went on to say that he finally understood visceral, what he'd been reading about in the Bible. 25 years later, Rick Dobler, the founder of MAPS, the mothership of, of psychedelic research and uh, education, as a graduate student for his PhD dissertation, did a 25-year follow-up study. He found seven of the nine divinity students from that experience who had had uh, who had had a, a religious ex or spiritual experience, go there. and they all said that it was either one of the top most significant experiences of their lives with ongoing benefits. Let's fast forward to 2016, and Roland Griffiths, the uh, grandfather of the psychedelic renaissance at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, where they did a study, a controlled study using high dose and low dose psilocybin on 53 advanced cancer patients dealing with anxiety, depression. After one or two high dose sessions, the participants said this was among the top five spiritual experiences of my life and among the top five of any experience I've ever had in my life. And Griffiths was in awe. I mean, he said, when you, with one or two doses, one or two sessions, when you can see a, a cancer patient who's been so beaten down, energized and rise up on their elbows and start to give comfort to their family and their caretakers, even we researchers are amazed. Now, let's pause and reflect on what's happening here. We have white-coated shamans in clinical settings, administering synthetic psilocybin that predictably generates mystical experiences, uniting religion and science. And these were in, in his book, uh, C.P. Snow, the philosopher, he talked about the two cultures, science based on empirical world, religion based on faith, and argued that the two would never meet. They're meeting together in psychedelic research. This is actually a psychedelic technology example of what Arthur C. Clarke, who wrote 2001, uh, A Space Odyssey, said, called, described as any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable, is indistinguishable from magic. What happened here was Johns Hopkins created this MEQ 30, Mystical Experience 30. It was a 30 part questionnaire that was refined and validated over decades to evaluate how, if a person had had a mystical experience and how intense that was. The five major components of a mystical experience that they evaluate in that questionnaire were unity and sacredness, a connection with all living things, even in, inanimate things, a positive mood, a tranquility, a sense, a profound sense that all is well in the big picture, even in the face of illness and death, which many participants came to view as a transition. The experience transcends time and space. It's in a mythical time. It puts you in touch with your, an authoritative voice, your authentic self and sometimes through visits to a temple of knowledge or sessions with wise women. It is ineffable, ineffable, it's indescribable. It's impossible to put it into words. One experience, a woman who is uh, riven with phobias and fears in a high dose LSD session, finds herself on the back of a large muscular Bengal tiger. The tiger takes her uphill through a forest and all of a sudden they come to a volcanic crater in which the lava is boiling. 
she is afraid, but without hesitation, her spirit animal, the tiger, leaps into the lava carrying her. And shortly after, she emerges as a bird and flies away. And after that session, her phobias were gone. She has tapped in. This is a mystical experience happening beyond time and space. And the phoenix is obviously the Jungian archetype of death and rebirth. Cosmic consciousness is the Olympus of mystical experience. And cosmic consciousness and the variety of psychedelic experiences have been well explored in Stanislav Grof's book, LSD, Doorway to the Numinous, the groundbreaking psychedelic research into realms of human unconscious. Grof himself, his first psychedelic experience in Prague, where he was a Freudian uh, psychotherapist and a psychiatrist, he had received from Albert Hoffman Sandoz Laboratory samples of the licit LSD, which Sandoz was sending out to psychiatrists around the world to see if it would have any promise to dealing with severe psychosis and, and neurosis and severe mental illness. Groff took it, and in his first session, he went out of his body and traveled through the entire cosmos into black holes and out. And on emerging from that session that's described in his work, he realized the futility of Freudian psychotherapy and he went on to develop LSD psychotherapy, seeing LSD as the royal road to the unconscious. And this has laid the foundation of the protocols we see still being used today. My wife, Julie, had a cosmic consciousness experience. Uh, when she was 21, she was a pretty uh, shy and insecure uh, person, very much beaten down by her family. And she went to a concert and someone approached her and her, her friend and said uh, he had a wonderful psychedelic for her. It was called Product 4. It was a combination of LSD, psilocybin, DMT, and who knows what else. Julie lay back on the grassy knoll she heard the gospel music sort of lifting her away. And then she started to see light be behind her eyes. And suddenly, before she knew it, she was catapulted out of her body into the cosmos, traveling faster and faster and faster. And eventually, she started to slow down. And I'll read from this experience, which is, which is in her book. As I moved through space, I began to notice that every star had a face and I recognized every face and felt a loving connection to each and every one. I became aware that my experience was in a cosmic dimension and was unlike any psychedelic encounter I had ever known before. I experienced the beauty of it all the utter magnificence of being connected to every particle and person in the universe. When she came to the next afternoon, she realized the concert was over and everyone had gone. And she was back on the earthly plane and she had a, realized that she had gone through a profound alteration of her mind and body, felt connected to all things, and even though this took place decades ago, it produced benef beneficial changes that have put her on her path in life. Uh, Lakshmi, how's my time right now? Oh, you're muted. Okay. Um, 15 minutes. I have 15 minutes or I have used 15 minutes? You've used 15 minutes and you have 15 okay. minutes. Okay, perfect. Um, let me say uh, the following. I've had in Jamaica in 1979 on uh, psilocybin, a mystical experience that was truly an epiphany. Um, I don't have time to go into it. Basically, I in the psilocybin state, I saw the clouds on the horizon transform into a crystal metallic structure that grew and grew. And the divine voice that had been speaking to me 
throughout the afternoon said, this is atomic energy. It is evil. You must destroy it. And I spent, I found my soul's code, my purpose out of that experience. I wasn't looking for it, but you get what you need. And I've spent the last four decades working anti-nuclear, anti-nuclear war, and for renewable energy. And it's still involved with that today. And one of the greatest gifts we can find in this life, along with a, a loving partner, is to define our, our life's work. Um, these are examples of how psychedelics have many benefits beyond mental health. They have benefits for creativity, for purpose, for personal growth, spirituality, and even deepening relationships. And I understand the political necessity of the current medical model and all the lands and the landmines that exist towards the mainstreaming of psychedelics and why there's a reluctance to talk about the very topic of our conference today, psychedelics for epiphanies and awakenings in personal experiences, but they continue to help healthy people. Let me conclude by saying that my personal experiences are just you know, one leaf on the cosmic tree of life. And I'm sure many of you have had your own experiences. I see all of us involved in the psychedelic enterprise as cathedral builders, as medieval cathedral builders who laid the foundations for churches and cathedrals with soaring spires that wouldn't be finished for another 100 to 200 years. They would never live to see the final product of what they had designed. And think about, imagine if you were back with the invention of the telescope or the microscope, and then 400 years later to the development of the electron microscope that lets us probe in to the COVID molecule, or the telescope, and 400 years later in the future, the launching of the James Webb Space Telescope that will let us look hundreds of millions of light years into the galaxy. Well, we are in the infancy of psychedelics, the mind scope, only discovered 1938, not so long ago. Imagine where we will be in 100, 200, years from now, it's almost impossible to conceive of what will emerge from the glimmerings of the foundations that we are now developing. I mean, it's impossible to imagine where we've come from the Nixon war on drugs in 1970s to today's psychedelic renaissance. Uh, I understand, and I know you'll appreciate the, I've only been able to touch briefly on these topics. I go into them in depth on my course on psychedelics past, present, and future, which you can find under education on the Psychedelics Today website. Uh, let me close with this for all of you engaged in this global psychedelic adventure. Adventure, rejoice. Our time has come. Thank you very much. I just want to say that what you were saying about um, uh, it, that we have only discovered it since 1938. Um, that is true, but isn't it also true that from a religious point of view, your book, The Psychedelic Gospels, did, um, did discover that there is evidence of use of psilocybin in Gnostic early Christian uh, religion? Yes, I mean, our, our book, the Psychedelic Gospels, Secret History of Hallucinogens in Christianity. In 2012, Julie and I traveled to cathedrals and churches throughout Europe and the Middle East, photographing psychedelic images, Amanita muscaria and psilocybin in Christian artwork, frescoes, illuminated manuscripts, sculpture, stained glass windows. And we came to the conclusion, along with dozens of other scholars, that yes, Christianity, like much of shamanism and many of the world's great religions, the Greek and Lucinian mysteries, the, the Hindu religion, and so many, the Hindu Greek Veda, have a psychedelic basis. What happened is in Christianity and the Judeo Christian world, from the Inquisition on, 
when the wise women of Europe became branded as the satanic witches, all pagan vestiges were stamped out by through the Inquisition, through the hundreds of years of the Inquisition. So we are just rediscovering these again. Anthropologists have known about it for decades and my ethnomycologists, but now through the work of, of uh, many people, um, and uh, especially people like Timothy Leary and Rick Doblin and the people at Johns Hopkins, we are rediscovering this and putting it on a medical basis. And as we've seen with uh, cannabis, legalization follows medicalization. So um, yes, there are these roots. There's roots way back in the archeological record showing uh, psychedelics being used 11,000 years ago. And if you take the cave paintings, maybe 30 or 40,000 years ago, as far as evidence exists, but we are just now rediscovering it and perhaps reintegrating it even into mainstream religions. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Lakshmi, and thank you, uh, Jerry, for your uh, presentation today. Um, I've been following your work for a little while. I uh, just heard your recent interview on uh, Psychedelics Today, which I thought was really uh, interesting. Um, I'm curious to hear uh, you talk a little bit about um, what impact you think kind of the mainstreaming uh, of psychedelics in, in, in the Western kind of culture uh, having on the future um, of, of religion, uh, if you had uh, to, to make predictions about how that's going to uh, impact the, the, how this, how uh, religion develops and evolves going forward. Okay. Yeah, a couple of things. Great question. And, and thank you. Um, first of all, what's fascinating right now is it's the scientists, the clinicians, the teams in the 47 public companies that are researching psychedelic medicine who are inducing mystical experience. So how long, and you have this phenomenon of you know, well-documented decline of participation in traditional religion and the growth in the Pew uh, Religious Research Survey of people who say they're spiritual but not religious, who are now 20% of the population and 33% of the youth, you know, some of whom are turning to psychedelics for a resacralization or a reintroduction of mysticism and magic uh, and many other benefits into their lives. Um, what is the relevance of these findings? for Christianity and, and what would the importance be for today, for today's psychedelic renaissance, aside from a, you know, an anthropological or, or history uh, fascinating you know, factoid, um, it's the following. Number one, and it, will, it may allow Christianity one day to return to its mystical roots. And we know that the use of ayahuasca, which contains DMT, in Santo Daime and, and Junia de Vegetal in Brazil have already been approved for use by the Brazilian Council of Bishops. So we can see one place that it's already been uh, integrated. The second thing is that perhaps this can lead to the establishment in all the religions, including Christianity, of religious retreat centers, a sort of the modern Eleusis that Albert Hoffman called for late in his life, where the faithful would have the opportunity, healthy people come to religious retreat centers in beautiful settings to explore psychedelics with the availability of guides for healing, growth, and divine revelation in the context of their own religion. And the third thing is an interesting aspect for legalization, because um, if you start out with the First Amendment and freedom of religion, and this is codified and re redefined or, or reaffirmed and, and strengthened in the 1993 Federal uh, Religious Freedom uh, Reclamation Act. And what this says is if you show a demonstrated use of a psychedelic, a sacred plant 
in your religious tradition, then you have a right now affirmed by the U.S. Supreme Court to integrate it into your religion. This is how the um, 300,000 members of the Native American church use peyote, are allowed to legally do it in the United States. And it's how um, U.S. Uh, branch members of Santo Daime and Nyanda Vegetal are legally able to use DMT or ayahuasca. So what happens here is by establishing this in Judaism and Christianity, you may have not only the medical pathway to legalization for psychedelic therapy centers, but also the religious freedom, the right of religious freedom pathway to legalization for personal growth. So there's a lot of potential there that the progress that has been made creates a plausible foundation that this could emerge in the future. Hi, Jerry. I have a question, a couple of questions for you, just kind of riffing off what you've shared so far, um, especially this last part. So I'm hearing you really talk about two routes of access um, that are primarily through a legalized framework of medicalization and religious use. And so I'm curious about how you perceive um, another route, which is full decriminalization, rewriting the Controlled Substances Act and how that might impact um, yeah, just sort of the cultural shifting and epiphanies and the ways that these medicines might express ourselves that we don't have a historical context for so far. And then the second, I guess, part of that question is I'm noticing um, religious sort of churches, um, quote unquote, popping up <laughs> that don't actually have um, necessarily full religious intent in their use behind these medicines. And it, it seems more of like kind of a, a legal loophole. And so I'm kind of curious of how do you see that potentially impacting negatively or positively um, when, when those are right, the only two structures essentially that can be held and contrasting that with rewriting controlled substance making things decriminalization and how that might shift the culture in a way that we don't yet know. Sure. You know, there's a, a really fascinating interchange in the near the end of Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, that has done so much uh, because he's such a best-selling author to, to shift public opinion on psychedelics. And he asked Roland Griffiths, uh, the director of the Johns Hopkins uh, Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research, uh, who's told him all about the marvelous progress they've made in the clinical studies for mental health issues. Uh, Michael Pollan says, do you think this will ever be used for healthy people? And Roland Griffiths, who's you know, very highly respected, been around Washington, navigated the bureaucracies, well aware of all the political minefields that exist around psychedelics, says, this is, psychedelics are too important they will be used for healthy people in the future. In other words, you kind of kick the can down the road, all right? Now, um, the medical model is already on the ground. I mean, it was passed in Oregon through the 2020 psilocybin um, services initiative. So there's already, we're seeing one state moving beyond the cities that have legalized or decriminalized into doing this. In terms of religious freedom, this is a, such a fundamental issue that it is one of the few issues that the Supreme Court agrees on. I mean, there was a case in Miami of Santeria, which is a form of shamanism, um, which involved animal sacrifice where the city tried to prohibit it. And it was nine to zero, even the conservative Scalia writing the, the majority opinion that you should never impinge unless there is some overwhelming you know, uh, cause for the government to do so, national security or something, on anyone's religious freedom. It's such a fundamental pillar of American thought, democracy, jurisprudence, and tied in with the First Amendment of free speech. 
So I believe that one of two things are going to happen. As the med and, and or they may dovetail into supporting each other. As the medicalization moves ahead, and obviously we're seeing you know breakthroughs happen all the time. Um, psilocybin and ecstasy are now breakthrough therapies under the FDA protocols for depression and for post-traumatic stress disorder. Because of all of that, we may eventually see from a medical basis, a call for taking the major psychedelics off of schedule one of the 1970s Controlled Substance Act. The other direction, in, and, and I think that is a very plausible area, but it will still be for medically approved and controlled situations. I think full discriminalization will have to happen when one of the mainstream churches makes the case and brings the prestige of the church behind it. And once that, if a Supreme Court decision was issued protecting you know, the right of, of Pentecostals or Lutherans to use psychedelics in the religious ceremonies, this would, this would open the door just like mothers saying that this cannabis strain helped my daughter relieve her epilepsy fits. So I think when you have that kind of credibility and power, it's one of two routes that this can go. Um, of course, there are always things that can derail things, but I think these, these trends are pretty fundamental. And I think that the people who are making the regulations today are, you know, my generation of people. They have had, unlike the people who wrote these laws and lied about them, they've had psychedelic experience. So I think that both of these avenues can lead to full legalization and decriminalization with the First Amendment one, uh, you know, granting more freedom for personal use. Hi. Hi, <laughs> um, I'm Sandra. And thank you so much for your talk. I really appreciated um, hearing your perspective and, and your background. Um, and since we were just talking about decriminalization and such, what do you feel, and I focus on ethics, and I'm curious, what do you feel um, is the number one thing we each could do to help move forward um, in the psychedelic space, either as a community or as an individual? You know, I think um, it's such a broad question. It is. That, um, that it's to make a commitment to find your place in the psychedelic uh, because things are expanding and moving so quickly now that there are many, many emerging career opportunities or specializations uh, for lawyers, for artists, for fundraisers to get involved, even if you are not a psychedelic researcher or a psychedelic clinician. So I think it's make a commitment to carrying out this kind of Gandhian truth force, the Sahyagraha, that's psychedelics obviously uh, embraces and find your place in it. Um, and there are many ways, I mean, there's clinical research, there's medical research, there's psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, there's media, there's conferences, um, there's blogs, there's join one of the many psychedelic societies, you know, near you, which are popping up Europe, United States, worldwide now, and see how you can participate. That's what I would recommend. 